Okay, picking up where we left off on page 698, talking about the uh, Apache configuration files. And in Ubuntu, they're, they're, you know, here's where the things are, and here's where the configuration files, and all the rest of these directories where things are. And the author of the book makes a comment about, you know, if you're using uh, Debian and Ubuntu, you got an awful lot of places to go, and blah, 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 blah. I'm thinking, man, I never had any trouble with that. But nevertheless, um, so the... Uh, I put in here, in the lecture notes, I put in a link to a website that basically explains how all this stuff works. Uh, it's a step-by-step -step guide on how to install Apache. I think when you get to that point of the, uh, it's part of the term assignment, when you get that part of the term assignment, probably one of the most complicated parts of that is when you, I'm going to give you a zip file with a web page in it, and you need to figure out how to extract that web, pipe, web page with all the directory structure intact and where to put it. I would highly recommend that you extract it to a directory in your home directory first. And then after you figured out what needs to be copied, then you would copy all of that stuff up into the real location uh, in, in the Apache site, okay? Don't try to extract it immediately at the location where it's supposed to go because most likely you'll end up with, like, with a second set of directories that you don't want. Okay, I'm going to skip all the rest of the choices because, hey, if you learn how to do Apache, then you learn them all, okay? All right, so now we're going to transition to Chapter 20. So Chapter 20 is about storage. Now, a lot of this we've already done. Okay, <clears throat> so on page 717, yeah, we skipped a bunch. And so we've already done this before, right? I, I want to add a disk. So what do you have to do? Well, you have to identify the disk. Probably with either the LSHW uh, for hardware, there's actually another one called LSBLK, which lists all block devices, but you know, hey. I have to partition the disk with either, we did it with uh, FDisk, but you can also use Parted. Uh, create a file system with uh, MKFS. Uh, mount the system with mount, and then maybe edit the uh, mount tab file, or FS tab, FS tab file so that it's permanent when you turn the machine back on, it comes back up. So on page 472, they talk about the different types of disks. You know, there's spinning disks, you know, traditional hard drives. There's flash-based disks, there's tapes, there's optical, there's all sorts of storage, right? And so what's happening is that the, um, the, the price and the uh, size have been doubling about, well, not the price hasn't been doubling, but price has been, that's hard to say. But anyway, let's just stick with the size. This size capacity has been doubling about 1.6 years. Every 1.6 years, the size of a disk capacity increases. Okay. The problem is, when you do this, the speed at which these disks are, are running have not kept up. I mean, the speeds are kind of stuck. You know, we're at most company, I mean, most organizations are at SATA 2. Now, at home, <coughs> when you only have maybe one or two disks, there's a really cool option where you can plug a solid state disk directly into an, a PCI Express slot. And that is super fast, a heck of a lot faster than SATA 2. The problem is in a corporate environment where I have 100 drives, that's not going to work. Excuse me. <coughs> <coughs> so, yes, faster things exists for like at home, but not in the corporate world. So, you know, SATA 2 is okay, but it has not been keeping up. So let's talk a lot about the traditional hard drives versus the solid state guys, the flash guys. So the typical size is, this may be a little old, but it's still relevant from a teaching perspective. You know, most hard drives are, you know, 16 terabyte. If you go buy an SSD, maybe a four terabyte would be about what you could get. The random access time, 8 milliseconds, but SSDs is practically nothing. That's, prob that's probably off by a factor of 10 or 100. It's actually tiny, 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 like 0 .0025. The sequential read capability, because if you're running over a SATA connection, I can only run about 200 megabits. But over here, I can probably get into the 400s and the 500s. Here's the real key. When I'm doing random reads, the hard drive just pokes down. 
because the way it's laid out, I'm over here on a spinning disk and I'm up, I'm out on the outer edge and you say, oh, I need this file over here. And it has to go, hang on. Then it reads that file. Oh, wait, I need one over here. And it moves over there and moves back. Well, that mechanical movement of the head takes time. And so random reads are horrible in a spinning drive. But solid state, they don't move. There's no moving parts. Hey, I need something over here. You know, it's like a, a square. I need something over here in this corner. Fine. You want something over here? Cool. You want something over here? Cool. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter where it is. It's all. In fact, it takes the same amount of time regardless of where it is. That's not exactly true, but just bear with me. And then, how many operations per second? Uh, what are the costs? Well, to tell you the truth, the cost of this is old. Uh, the costs are down to the point where solid state drive is a, a, a practically on on par. Practically on par. Reliability. To tell you the truth, this is kind of a strange thing. Um, <clears throat> remember I uh, showed, you, showed you guys a, a thing. <clears throat> uh, maybe I didn't. Anyway, um, hard drives, because they have moving parts, have, generally speaking, poor reliability. In a corporate environment, you know, having a 2 or 3 or 4% annual failure rate is not unheard of. Um, SSDs, to tell you the truth, they're kind of different. Here's the scenario. A hard drive, if, if it's gonna fail, it typically gives you warnings, right? It'll say, hey man, I, I'm tired. You know, I'm having a tough time doing this. Can, can you just give me a break a minute? And so you can see that it's struggling. And so you can go buy another hard drive and then, and then swap it out, you know, your tired old drive that's kind of about to fail. It gives you warning signs before it fails. SSDs, typically, I'm fine and happy, and then, boom, I'm dead. I mean, there's no warning sign. There's no indication that something went wrong. It just goes from working to not working in an instant. Uh, so it's a little different. Uh, limited number of writes. Well, hard drives, you could just write over the content over and over and over. And then, But SSDs, at the, at the very beginning of uh, SSDs, there was an awful lot of hue and cry about you know, if you write to the same location over and over again, um, you know, you're going to wear out the, the, the cell in that thing. And so it may go, or, won't work anymore. So I went and got a, a half terabyte, one of those itty bitty guys that plugs into the, onto the motherboard directly into a, a PCI slot. I got one of those guys. And I figured out, you know, doing the math and plus reading the, uh, the literature, that it would take, if I wrote to every single location on that drive, nonstop, every day, it would take about 30 years before the wear on the drive would start showing up. And quite frankly, I probably won't keep that thing 30 years. In fact, I'd be surprised if I kept it for three years. Because three years from now, I'm probably going to get a four terabyte one to replace that one, you know, because things the way things work. <clears throat> okay. So hard disk, you know, spinning platters, uh, you know, 7,200 RPM, and they had 10,000 RPM, and... I had a 15,000 RPM drive, uh, a Western Digital Raptor. Woo, it was nice. But they have movable heads. And um, that's not good because things that move tend to wear out. That's just the way it works. Things with moving parts are things you have to deal with. Let's talk about some definitions. So a cylinder is <clears throat> everything I can read without moving the head. So the, the heads almost look like fingers. So uh, here's the, the, the platters that are spinning, and here are the heads, and they kind of fit in between. And so as the things that these are spinning, the heads move in and move out and move in and move out, okay? So if you're looking at it from the top view, uh, a cylinder would be everything that you could read on one track on the top and then the next one below it and then the next one below it and the next, and like a 3D version of... A, a track and then another track and then another track and then another track and then another track. A cylinder. Everything I can read without moving the head. A track, of course, is one of those things on one of those platters. And then those things are broken up into sectors. And typically they're fixed size sectors. You don't get to pick. Um, so they're all the same size. And so um, the way it works is <clears throat> Uh, a cylinder has many tracks, a track has many sectors, okay? Is that making sense? Okay. So a disc has many cylinders, a cylinder has many tracks, tracks have many sectors. Okay, got it? Okay, good. <clears throat> so 
Um, this thing about uh, going to reliability. So there's this really cool company called Backblaze. And so Backblaze is a weird company because they're not actually in the 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 disk they're not really in the disk reliability business okay that's not really what they're doing um they're just a, a, a like a hosting provider they just provide storage okay but because they buy an awful lot of disks they just started keeping track and then they started just posting it on the website which is actually pretty cool. I just found second quarter 2019. Doesn't really matter which one it is. So here's the annualized failure rate. And so it looks like that particular Seagate model is causing them trouble. About 2.58% annual failure rate. <clears throat> here's another Seagate model with a. Okay, I look, I'm not saying anything bad about Seagate. Don't get me wrong. I'm just saying these companies who they're not a disk reliability company. They're a, a storage hosting or cloud service provider. It's just that they buy an awful lot of disks, so they just so happen to make it out here. So, you know, a 2 or 3% annual uh, failure rate, uh, you know, if I had a couple hundred drives, right? Let's say I had, I don't know, 500 drives. You know, 5% failure rate uh, a year, uh, okay, that's a lot, right? One of the weird things that these guys have determined, <clears throat> and I think this is a fascinating thing, that I, and it's counterintuitive, I would have never have guessed it in a million years, <clears throat> and that is they've determined that there's no real correlation between like the temperature of the drive, how if it's in a if it's in a case that gets really, really hot, or a case that's well ventilated, or a difference between a drive that's just having the shit beat out of it versus one that's just kind of over here doing something kind of every once in a while. There's no correlation but between failure rate and temperature or usage. Who would have thought? <clears throat> I would have never have guessed that. I would have assumed the hotter it got or the more you used it, that would be indicative of whether or not it's going to last a long time. Turns out it's not the case. So there's an awful lot of things that can go wrong with a disk, what, you know, called failure modes. One of them is called surface rot which means physically there's iron oxide on the, on the platter, on the spinning disc, and um, you can have it flake off. So not that many years ago, there was a, uh, a company that had glass coated the platters for whatever reason. It doesn't, could it be marketing, I don't know. And uh, sure enough, uh, we had one of those and somebody dropped it on the floor and it, it kind of shattered the stuff. And so you picked up the drive. And it, remember those rain sticks you used to be able to find at these goofy stores where you hold it up and they kind of go, shh. You could pick up this drive and turn it on it. Go, it'll go, shh, shh. Yeah, the coating fell off of the platters. That drive was toast. <clears throat> um, another one is just mechanical failure. If you drop one while it's working, it's very likely that the head will come in contact with the platter and gouge out a chunk of the the media like that's bad it'll damage the head and damage typically you throw those away now this is a thing called smart uh smart is an acronym uh in fact hell i don't remember what it's an acronym for let's go find out <clears throat> what does smart Self-monitoring analysis and reporting technology. I knew it, I knew it was something. <clears throat> anyway, smart is a way that you could go in and look at the health of your hard drive. It keeps track of, hey man, uh, I had to go read this one over a second time. That would be really, you know, rereads, you know, write failures, things of that nature. It's very good. Now we can't demo it here because we're in a virtual world, and so the smart isn't really going to work for us, right? Because we don't really have a physical hard drive. Make sense? Okay. Uh, we're coming up on the 15-minute mark again, so you know what's going on.